You're listening to the Packer Net Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packer Net Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore da da. Well, folks, it's about to go down, man. It's about to go down. I don't know what that means. I just felt like saying it. I just, I got a, I got a surge of feel good energy. It's one of those things where I just realized, man, it's Saturday. I don't have to do anything. Actually, I do. I have some stuff to do, but um, still Saturday, and that realization hit me, and I'm doing the podcast, which I love, and I'm sipping some cold instant coffee, which I'm digging on, and um, I mean, what could be better? I don't know. I don't know too many things that could be better. It could be nicer weather, so I could grill out some food and uh, in comfort or whatever, and uh, I probably shouldn't list off the negative things so I can enjoy the positive vibes for a few more minutes <laughs> before reality sets in. Oh... That was a roller coaster, huh? I'm glad I took you on that little journey. What are we talking about today? Um, the Packers did sign a new player, so um, I, I, I will be honest. The Packers signed one of Snoop Dogg's former players, Mr. Keyshawn Nixon. It's a lot of little nuggets on this guy, and I, and, and I like the signing, although I did, as I said, laugh hysterically when I saw this because um, obviously everybody's been waiting for wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver. As I've said, that's just a, a, an obsession. It is a need. I get that. But the gap between the need and the obsession compared to the need at other positions with no concern whatsoever um, is a little comical. And we've talked about that a little bit yesterday with the mock drafts and everything. By the way, apologies for yesterday's podcast getting out so late. Um been having some issues with the host company where I upload and then there's errors and I don't find out until later and there's not a lot I can do about it at work. Um, actually, there is, but I just I just learned that there is. And so um, it took me a while to get it fixed, but I got it fixed and we're good to go. But uh, yeah, first nugget on cornerback Keyshawn Nixon is that uh, Snoop Dogg's former player. If you didn't know, Snoop Dogg's got some kind of a football thing. It's the Snoop Youth Football League, I guess. So that's always fun. I think the biggest connection being made with Keyshawn Nixon is that he was a quote-unquote standout on Rich Passaccia's special teams unit with the Raiders. So that's going to be the number one um, connection. And and I'm guessing that, well, I'll I'll say that I think that makes the most sense for why he's probably here. We haven't done a lot, and granted there's not much to do, but we haven't done a lot so far to go to Rich Passaccia and say, what can we do to fix this? Because just hiring Rich Passaccia doesn't just fix everything. Although I think the players were kind of full of it when they were like, look, man, it's not Mo Drayton's fault. It it's just comes down to execution. Sorry, I'm not buying it. Um, I do think there was also a lack of execution. I think being that bad had a lot to do with the guy in charge. And we've provided sev- several examples of coaching issues in particular, not just execution issues. But there is also execution issues. I mean, the it, it can clearly be both when you're by far the worst special teams unit in football. I mean, those two things combine to create this monstrosity. And so um, Bisaccia can kind of raise up the floor, but if we're going to go beyond that and actually create a really good special teams unit, you have to change some of the personnel, and we haven't really done that. And again, there isn't much that we can do at this point, or just in general, because there are limits to how many people can be on your team. And so we're kind of getting to the point where if you want to add somebody, who are we going to get rid of? It would be somebody that's just a special teamer. And to be honest, I don't know that anybody is considered just a special teamer. They might technically be just a special teamer, but, I mean, if you're a linebacker, you're expected to step up and be a linebacker on some level. So that's kind of a complex thing. But the struggle I have is the fact that Keyshawn Nixon, via PFF, has never really been good at special teams at all. Now, there is something to be said about bringing a guy over that understands assignments, right? Again, if we're just still at the stage of raising the floor, there's certain things that, you know, and I believe it, as little as I know about offense and defense, I know less about special teams in terms of all the different roles and, and assignments and expectations. And presumably he fits something. And I don't know what that is. But I do know that his grades via special teams for the Raiders were 40, 43, and 53 over three years. So this is not an ace special teamer. We have many people on our team that graded out much higher. 
And for all the anti-PFFers out there, that's fine. But please understand, PFF is not so bad that they're exactly opposite. You know, again, if, if, if the guy got a 60 overall grade and you think he's more like 70-ish, if you did your own homework and everything else and you think he's better because PFF isn't perfect, I get that. But to say the guy had a 40, 40 overall grade, but really it should have been an 80, they said he's terrible, but actually he's phenomenal. I don't really think that's a thing. So there's a good chance that that has um, a lot to do with it being a Rich Passaccia special teamer. That is what he spent a lot of his time doing. 700 snaps for the Raiders were on special teams. That's compared to over three years, 274 snaps uh, on defense. But I want to I want to dream a little bit here for just a second. You guys know that I really am opposed to the idea of putting Jair at least full-time in the slot. Once in a while, different packages, having some fun, whatever, I don't care. Not a fan of it, though, just in terms of, well, we love Stokes and we love Razul, so those are going to be the boundary guys. So by default, Stokes, sorry, I just, I, I cannot ever wrap my head around that. Even if he goes in the slot and is, you know, an elite corner, I'm still the whole year just going to be grumbling because I just cannot wrap my head. I mean, it would have been like putting Devontae full-time in the slot because we got two boundary guys that we like that can't play in the slot, and we know Devontae can. I just, I don't, I don't like that so much. Or, or, you know, we're short on wide receivers, and A.J. Dillon's a good running back, so by default, Aaron Jones, we're just going to split you out full-time. I mean, come on, he's a good receiver. Granted, he's a better running back, and I hate to lose his production at running back, but, you know, we need receivers, and we got A.J. Dillon, so we'll be fine. You just go play receiver. Hate it. All right, so there, there's, there's the, the uh, starting point. Keyshawn Nixon on defense had grades of 30, 44, and then 77. Now, it's all relatively small sample sizes, with the exception of 2020, he played a significant, significant amount, and 2021 wasn't that bad. But if we look at what his assignments were, he was a boundary slash strong safety. It was a weird, it's not a very normal thing that you see, is strong safety that sometimes plays on the boundary. But um, week two against Kansas City, his first time playing, he was a boundary guy, 28 overall grade. Um, then week eight, strong safety, 59 overall grade, only played one snap, so granted it was a 60. And then week 16, he played on the boundary again, 42 overall grade. So just bad. Then in 2020, boundary 50, boundary 39, safety 60, boundary 60, uh, boundary 52, boundary 57, safety 63, uh, boundary 44, boundary 55. So that's two years. Now we get into 2021. They put him out on the boundary, 54 overall grade. Then in week 15 against Cleveland, they put him in the slot. This is the first time in three years that he's been on the Raiders. They put him in the slot. He got an 81.6 overall grade. Excuse me? 81, 34 snaps, by the way. This is the most he's played, I think, probably in a game. 34 snaps. He plays in the slot. 81.6 overall grade. 80 tackling. 85 pass rush grade. They use him as a pass rusher four times. He ends up getting pressure once. And a 76.8 coverage grade. So um, that seems promising. So what happens next week, week 16? He plays 32 snaps where? In the slot. What's his grade? 72.7 with a 73.9 overall coverage grade. Then he goes to strong safety, plays one snap, 61 overall grade. Then he plays slot, again, one snap, so it's a 61 overall grade. Now, 61 is, by the way, positive, which means it was above, it's hard to get any elite grades when you play one snap. Generally, you're going to be at 60, plus or minus whatever you did, but it was a plus. So he was headed in the right direction again. So, I mean, and and this is not the first time he's ever played slot, but it was the first time he was primarily a slot. He played one snap in 2019 in the slot. He played nine snaps out of 155 in 2020. Um, And then this year, with his 77.4 overall grade, he played 52 snaps in the slot, which was his primary assignment. That was compared to 14 on the boundary and 14 in the box. He played more in the slot combined than those other spots. So, I mean, and you know, at 5'10", 193, it seems like a much more normal assignment for a guy. I mean, I understand it's more assignment than it is just general size, right? It's it's how you play and everything else and strengths and weaknesses, but he he certainly looks like a slot corner. And so I'm going to dare to dream here that maybe he's not a terrible slot corner. Maybe the, the 80 overall and the 72 overall is a little bit of a fluke. Maybe. By the way, let's see who he played up against. Let's see who he played against. So he went up against, uh, at least as far as his three targets went, David Njoku and Demetric Felton. Demetric Felton is the super fast guy. David Njoku is a massive human being. 
So that accounted for three targets of the total snaps that that he had. Then in week uh, 16, he's going up against Jerry Judy and Melvin Gordon. And again, he went up against significantly more people than that. But these are at least two that we know of. And Jerry Judy was one target, zero receptions. It was a drop, but whatever. And again, 74 overall grade. So these are the kinds of people he went up against. And Jerry Judy is their slot guy. So he went up against probably Jerry Judy most of the game. And occasionally a tight end, occasionally a split out running back, whatever. So again, I, I understand that this is probably more to do with uh, bringing in a guy that um, was a Rich Bisaccia special teamer. It's going to help Rich to not have to coach up a bunch of guys that know nothing about how to play in his defense, don't know anything about what is expected, don't know any of that stuff. You bring a guy over that that has a good work ethic and um, sets a good example, can help other guys answer questions and all this kind of stuff. It's nice to infuse a little bit of that, even if he's not the best player in the world. But still, I'm holding out hope that this guy could potentially be a quality Chandon Sullivan replacement. Anyways, there was uh, something I think I was going to tell you yesterday that I didn't quite get to, and so I want to do it today. Um, we're kind of going backwards. We've, we've talked about this fine gentleman before, but we're going to go ahead and uh, do it again real quick, just because, again, things are being said that are just somewhat incorrect. And as much as I don't want to come off as being anti any Packers player, I can't just let silly things be said and not... It's just about understanding things properly. That's all. And the guy we're talking about is Jerron Reed. First of all, Jerron Reed's contract details have come out. Um, it was a one-year, $3.25 million contract with $1.492 million in uh, dead in whatever. That doesn't even make sense. It has four void years on it. So what they did is they brought the $3.25 million down to a base salary of just over a million bucks. And then the rest of this is in a bonus, which was paid to him in a check or will be paid to him in a check or whatever. And it's the check that we handed him that's going to be spread out. So he's going to make an additional million dollars as a salary. And then the the check that we handed him, which makes up the bulk of the rest of the money, is going to be spread out. But of course, one of those has to hit this year. The rest are over the four years, which we don't. I'm going to clarify again because I've said this before. Four void years doesn't mean we're paying this over four years. You can't do that. When a player leaves, which will be next year because it's, that's what a void is, it means your contract is null and void, which means you have to go bye-bye, the, the check, all the debt is due. So it's what's called accelerated. So $373,000 over four years gets accelerated into next year. So next year, we're going to pay $1.492 million. That's what he's referring to as whatever. So it's not that big of a hit. Uh, we want to minimize the dead money. We're taking on a lot this year, but... Um, the only reason I don't super mind is because a lot of the negative cap situation we're in next year won't be there, or, or this year won't be there next year, because all the dead cap goes bye-bye, and we got, but I, I don't want to create new dead money. Anyways, so that's that's one thing. But um, I, again, with the statistics on Jerron Reed, and as I've said, there, there's, there's plenty of positives. In fact, Sam Holman put together an article yesterday. It's about as comprehensive of an article as I've ever seen on one player talks about his fit on the team, talks about the positives, shows highlights of every single thing he details in terms of run defense, gap and a half stuff, where you basically grab the guy in front of you, you peek out of one side, like basically telling the running back, I got I got this gap, so don't even try it. And then when they say, okay, I'll go on the other side, then you say psych and you throw the defensive or the offensive lineman the other direction, you make a tackle. One of the highlights, he actually went back and forth. It was pretty funny. The running back tried to psych him out, but he had such control of the offensive lineman, which has got to be pretty embarrassing to be an offensive lineman and almost like pretending you're blocking somebody when really the guy just has complete control of you and throws you around at his... It's pretty impressive. But So I'm not saying there isn't an argument for Jerron Reed. I mean, the Packers have done a great job of identifying the right fits for their team. And again, if you want to understand maybe what the Packers are thinking, go check out Sam Holman's article for, I believe it's Wisconsin Sports Heroics, but just go to his Twitter and you can find it. Um, there's the second half with those freaking chairs, dude. Crazy. There is the second half of the year argument. It's a better microphone. Hopefully it wasn't, you didn't hear it or it wasn't very loud. I don't know. But again, he did really solid the second half of, of last year. If you start in like week 13 or whatever, he had two really bad games and a bunch of mediocre games, but, but that was it compared to the first half of the year, which was just entirely bad, not a single good game. So there was some improvement there, right? But what I don't like is when certain people let's just pretend they're podcasters, say things like how elite he was in the playoffs or the fact that um, you look at his quarterback hits 
and how he ranks and all these kinds of things. And then you, you, you cherry pick enough to make statements like best defensive tackle we've had since Mike Daniels. No, no, he's not. No, he's not. And again, it just gets really annoying when we cherry pick to try to just create either a positive or a negative view. Why don't you just try to be accurate? I don't understand what the problem with being accurate is. Again, if you look at quarterback hits, last year he had eight. Kenny Clark had 11. The next highest on our team was two. Well, there you go. That answers every question, except why are we highlighting hits? That doesn't make any sense. There's pressures, and then if you want to, you can highlight sacks because that's the most important, but highlighting hits doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? You're also not putting it in the context of opportunities. The fact that his 539 um, attempts is second only to Kenny Clark, who had 547. The next highest was Dean Lowry at 441. Or we could look at his sacks. For example, he had four, which Kenny Clark only had four. Dean Lowry had six because Dean Lowry's better. Or wait, no, he's not better. That's just a silly thing to look at, which is why I've said consistently with a lot of pushback that judging a player based on things like sacks and interceptions is kind of stupid. Now, granted, if you get tw- it's, it's one of those threshold things where if, if you're up in the, the double digits, if you're at 15, if you're at 20, you're a good football player because, bad, because it's just a, it's a disqualifier. Bad football players physically can't get there. But if you're talking about the difference between three, four, five, six, I don't know, dude, but he had four. So just in order of this past year, it would go Dean Lowry, then Kenny Clark, then Jerron Reed, then Kingsley Kiki, who played 269 pass rush snaps and had three sacks. So if you quantify the amount of opportunities, he would be down near the bottom. In fact, he'd probably be below TJ Slayton as well. But how about we look at pressure percentage, which again, I love that stat because it just asks a very simple question. On all the times that you're trying to get to the quarterback, how many times did you succeed at getting to the quarterback? And by the way, the Kansas City Chiefs have a very, very, very good defensive tackle on their team. In fact, he's, he's better than Kenny Clark is. So the idea that, well, they don't have anybody else, so he ended up getting more double teams, and it was harder for him, and he'll thrive over here because he has Kenny. Sorry, I don't think so. His pressure percentage, 33 divided by 539, 6.1%. That is garbage. Again, maybe he has a great year. He's probably a great fit. He can probably do some stuff. I don't know. But let's not get silly. Let's not get stupid. Let's not talk about best defensive tackle we've had since Mike Daniels. That is psychotic and insane. Because just this year, and I don't feel like putting in this much work to go back over every single defensive tackle we've had going all the way back to Mike Daniels. By the way, Mike Daniels was sitting at about 12% a year consistently with 70, 80, 90 PFF grades regularly in the games that he played top-tier, psychotic, great defensive tackle that we had for many years. This guy, Jerron Reed, who, by the way, is, is, has a $1 million, ba- got signed to a $3 million contract. Are we Come on now. I mean, I, I understand that everybody has to know better, but I don't know that everybody knows better. And the problem is it's hard to know better when the person isn't giving you any other information, just that he does really well in quarterback hits and he had 11 sacks in 2020, and he had 11 sacks in 2018, and he was, he's the best we've had since Mike Daniels. I mean, that's, that's, just, that's just the entire picture I'm providing with no additional context. And it's up to you to basically say, those stats are clearly cherry-picked, so I know it's not real, but you still don't have any information. Is he good? Is he bad? I don't know anything. So whoever it is that you're listening to that's saying any of this kind of stuff, and I said the same thing with guys like Yannick Ngakwe going to other teams, and I'm going to say it with guys coming to Green Bay. It's not just about hating players that go to other teams. It's not about hating guys that come to our team. It has nothing to do with hate. It's very simple. Understanding, in its proper context, what is Jerron Reed? He is a guy that is, has been average for five years, uh, six years, five years with Seattle, one year with Kansas City. The last two years have been his two worst years, 56 and 54 overall grades. We can still call it average. The entire first half of last year, he didn't have a single good game. 48, 57, 47, 45, 43, 39, 49, 47, 40. It wasn't until week 10 against Las Vegas, he had a 70, then he goes right back to a 48. And that second half stretch, again, it was really just three really good games, an 84 against Denver, 85 against Buffalo in the playoffs, 82 against Cincinnati in the playoffs. But the rest of the games were 65, 43, 43, 66, 67, 66. So at best, he's consistently average, but he also has a bunch of really bad games, but occasionally can give you a couple good games. And his pressure numbers are horrific. 
And so, you know, again, you, you go look at Sam Holman's article and he will tell you that I'm wrong and I'm, you know, that's not true. And he's actually a very good pass rusher and that's completely fine. He's got his, he's got a lot of experience. He's, he's very intelligent. He knows what he's talking about in terms of scheme and, and assignment. And I'm, I'm, I'm confident as soon as the Packers picked him, because I know the Packers have done a very good job of identifying guys that can thrive in their own system. So I'm, I'm fine with all that. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters, the only real measure of being a good pass rusher, as far as anything that I care about, is the production. You can call a guy a great fundamental pass rusher all you want, but if he never gets to the quarterback, if he only gets to the quarterback 6% of the time, I'm sorry, the production isn't there. And it's never really been there. In, in 2020, oh, great pass rusher, 11 sacks. It's so amazing. He's, he's the greatest since, you know, whatever you want to call it, 6%. It was just a massively inflated sack number. When he got pressures, the, the amount of sacks, the, the, the sack to pressure ratio was massively through the roof. But he was still only at 6% of the time, which is 94% of the time when he's trying to get to the quarterback, he doesn't. The year before that, he only had four sacks. But you know what? 7% pressure rate. So that was one of his better years as a pass rusher in terms of actual production. Still terrible. Again, 10% is the baseline. If you get to 10%, you're fine. You're adequate. That's decent. Looking at our own guys, by the way, Kenny Clark, 42 divided by 441, 9.5%. I'm sorry, that's Dean. I'm, I was going to say that seems low. Um, Dean with this six sacks. But even he was at 9.5%. Dean Lowry, better pass rusher than uh, Jerron Reed has ever been. Kenny Clark, 12.4%. Kingsley Kiki, I know he's not on the team, but he played a few snaps last year in 12 different games, 8.9%. So, you know, I'm not opposed to Jerron, but let's not be stupid, okay? Let's not just get so overhyped that we just do silly things. If you want to be excited, get excited. That's fine. Again, I want you to go read Sam Holman's article because it's going to show you what he's capable of, and that's cool. That's exciting. But if you've convinced yourself that this is an elite player that we just signed for $3 million, you are deluding yourself. And so I feel like I've made this point already, but because I've heard other people say other things that are ridiculous, I'm going to make sure that we address this one more time and be very, very clear. And if you have any other questions on Jerron Reed or what about this, what about that, let me know. Because there's very little to get super excited. He, 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 let me give you one one good thing. And by the way, last year with Kansas City, he had a 54 run defense grade. But aside from that, 63, 68, 66, 66, and basically we'll call it 60. So he's, he's consistently average. Why does that matter? That's not exciting. Because last year, our entire defensive line, the best run defender was Kenny Clark with a 56 overall run defense grade. So it's entirely possible he's going to be our best run defender. And, and at that, he'll be exactly average. Although it's entirely more possible that Kenny Clark just kind of returns to form. Um, His lowest prior to this was a 67. Last year was a 74, and he's got several nearly elite grades at, uh, you know, the whole uh, run defense thing. But compared to Tyler Lancaster's 56, Dean Lowry's 53, Jack Heflin's 52, Abdullah Anderson's 48, Kingsley Kiki's 48, and TJ Slayton, again, the guy who's meant to be a run defender, uh, 44 overall grade, the worst run defender on our entire defensive line. But again, I don't think that this is even about what elite attributes does he bring. It's just a guy. It's a guy to fill in for guys that have left. Tyler Lancaster, go bye-bye. We need a guy that can play those snaps. Significant, consistent snaps. So we got a guy. Anyways, why don't we take a break here? We'll come back and talk about some draft stuff. I wanted to kind of hypothesize with you a little bit and then um, kind of run over to PF, or to, I keep doing that, over to... uh, Patreon, and see if we can chip away at a couple other questions that uh, we still have not gotten back to. So remember, we got the two GoFundMes in the uh, Packing It Podcast Facebook group. We're still only about $1,200 away from reaching the $10,000 goal. I really feel confident we can close this one out very, very soon. Check out the pinned GoFundMe to help Drew out to get his seizure service dog. And as always, remember to head over to A Modern Frontier. can buy you some log dogs, some butcher's dozen ground beef, one-eighth grass-fed beef box, one-quarter pastured pork box. You got the Taste of the Farm sample box, the pastured chicken sample box, uh, grass-fed beef sample box, pastured pork sample box. So all different sizes and all different combinations of beef, pork, and chicken, um, all farm-raised right here locally in Wisconsin. So reach out and uh, buy you some meat, and it will be delivered in a box to your door. We'll take a uh, wait. Uh, meat packer, one word, all caps, $25 off your order. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. 
They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. So if you listen to JJ's episode this past week, um, he was talking about uh, different options as far as moving up, moving back, et cetera, et cetera. And it kind of got my, uh, my brains thinking a little bit. You know, I've, I've mentioned a couple times that I don't really like the trade for Tyreek and the trade for Devontae from the perspective of the Raiders and the Dolphins. And the biggest reason is if you're giving up all your money and you're giving up all your picks for one player, unless we're maybe talking about a quarterback because it's hard to to nail those positions down. But if you're talking about a position like a wide receiver or a tight end or an offensive lineman or whatever, my position is you should probably be pretty close to one player away, or at the very least believe that with this player, we have a legit chance of winning a Super Bowl. I don't think the Raiders or the Dolphins, that makes any sense. I think they both have way too many holes. The Raiders need way too much on the defensive side of the ball. And they have no ability to do that now because they have no picks and they have no money. The Miami Dolphins, as I said, they they got Tyreek Hill. That's fantastic. They still have a lot of holes, including the from center, right guard, and right tackle. Horrific offensive line. They did pick up two guys, and that's great, but they still have three terrible offensive linemen. They just, they have needs. They have other needs that, that I think they should address before they, you know, do anything else. The only thing I can make sense of for Miami is to say that we have two picks the following year. And so this is, you know, Tyreek is going to be the long term. We don't know if Tua is. So this will be sort of an evaluation year. And either it works out and we continue to build next year with our two picks, get some offensive line, whatever else we need to make a run in 2023 with Tyreek and Tua. Or we use those two picks to go get a new quarterback and new quarterback with Tyreek and whatever else we're able to do. So from that perspective, if we're talking about we're trying to get Tyreek to help us win in 2023, I guess I get it. But the point is, the two teams that made more sense in terms of getting Devontae and Tyreek is the Packers and the Chiefs, because the Packers and the Chiefs are teams that are on the doorstep of the Super Bowl. And with those players, which they already had, but the point is, if you're talking about signing them, paying them, the compensation that goes with that, the Packers make more sense, the Chiefs make more sense, because they're right there. The Packers have the offensive line, the quarterback, they have the defensive line, they have the corners, they have the pieces in place where you can make an argument that if we, if you know, you can make an argument that they are one player away, that a guy like Devontae makes the difference between being a team that's going to struggle to compete and being a team that is a Super Bowl contender. What does that have anything to do with trading up in the draft? Well, the point is, teams like the Chiefs and teams like the Packers are a player away. And if a team is going to sacrifice, if a team is going to be, let's call it reckless, if a team is going to do something um, that maybe isn't exactly advisable, you want it to be a move that um, is going to put you over the hump. Beyond that, the Packers clearly have done everything in their power to to maintain this all-in status for the last three years or so. They went all-in to bring back Aaron Rodgers. There's almost no doubt in my mind that they are going to do something drastic to make sure that they are a team that can compete, and at this point they are not because they don't have the wide receivers to do it. I like Alan Lazard. Tunyon can do some stuff, kind of, sort of, and whenever he's healthy. And we have running backs, but I don't know that the offensive line is super great, so we can't really run the ball at an elite pace because of largely the offensive line not being great run blockers. 
And so just as a hypothesis, and I'm not saying this is the case or this is what I would do, although in this cer certain circumstance it is. Let's say there is one Justin Jefferson in this entire class, and it's not Chris Olave, and it's not Drake London, and it's not Traylon Burks. What if it's Garrett Wilson? I really, really like Garrett Wilson. I know he's a little bit smaller, but I do think he's different, and I do think he separates himself. And as I've said, I do think that there is sort of a drop-off in terms of you take a risk with Traylon Burks and Chris Olave and, and Drake London and all these other guys in terms of the percentage chance that they end up being a real top-tier contributor, especially in year one, which the Packers do need. I'm just saying, what if? I'm saying, what if we could package our two picks and you could get the guy that you believe to be Justin Jefferson and let's say Garrett falls to 10? As I said, I think if based on the Rich Hill chart, I think you can get to eight, but you know you still need teams to accept it or whatever. You got Atlanta at eight, Seattle at nine, the Jets at 10, Washington at 11, what if Garrett does fall in those ranges? I've seen some people really like Drake London. Maybe Drake goes first. Maybe the Jets take Drake London. And Washington is sitting on the board at 11 is willing to trade. I generally, and I know there's a lot of Packer fans that are a lot like me, do not like trading up. In fact, there are a lot of people pounding the table for moving back because the more picks, the better. Give me the quantity and, and let Gutekunst just feast in the second round. All right, we'll get, we'll get maybe still two first round picks, but it'll be, you know, picks 28 and, and 32 and then three second-round picks, or whatever the case may be. But I'm just saying, what if? And, and again, keep in mind, we are, we are officially invested in all-in. Aaron Rodgers is not coming back so that we can win in 2023 or 2024. That isn't the intention. We're taking two solid swings at this thing. Maybe three. We'll see how long Aaron Rodgers feels like sticking around. But we're not in a position to be, uh, you know, throwing in the towel for the first year. You know, this is a multi-year rebuild. BS. We are, we are right now one wide receiver away what the heck good is two first round picks? And again, I think the reason most people don't want to do this is because we generally view the wide receivers as being similar. We generally say, yeah, Garrett Wilson's a little bit better, but Olave's fine. But what if he's not? Right? Because this is, this is the draft time of year where everybody's great. This is the time of year where the top eight wide receivers are all great. There's, there's probably 10 or 11 guys that we think are going to be great just at wide receiver. There's like nine, 10 pass rushers we like. There's three or four defensive tackles that are all going to be elite. But in reality, there's going to be five total guys that have good rookie years. The odds that any more than one first round rookie goes on to dominate and, and goes to have, it doesn't even have to be Justin Jefferson, but let's say top 15 potential, the odds that there's more than one is very close to zero. Top 20 even, very close to zero. This past year, there were two. It was, um, obviously, Jamar Chase was one of them, but uh, the other was fourth-round pick Amon Ross St. Brown. So it was not one of the top two wide receivers that everybody thinks is going to be great. It was a fourth-round pick. In 2020, there were two in the top 20, and Brandon Ayuk was number 20. So let, let's say there's two, but, but again, the idea that it doesn't matter. As long as we get either Garrett or, I mean, if you can't get Garrett, fine, but it, as long as you get either Olave or Burks or London or Pickens, or any of these guys will be fine, and we'll be happy with that. No, man, I'm saying probably one, maybe two, will end up being good wide receivers. Some of these guys are not going to pan out. And so, again, my hypothetical is, let's say the Packers' assessment is that Garrett Wilson is on another plane. He is the Justin Jefferson that we allowed to slip through our fingers that year, that the Vikings traded up for, and we, you know, we, we, weren't aggressive enough to go up and get the guy because, you know, we weren't as desperate for wide receiver like we are this year. He's the guy. And we like Olave and we, we're okay with London and Burks and Pickens and we're fine with these guys. But, you know, on, on a 10 point scale, we got Justin Jefferson at like an 8.9 and the rest of these guys are at like seven nines or something, seven fives. I mean, it's, it's one guy that we think is, is generational and one guy that we, and the rest of these guys we think are decent. Like they'll, they'll probably be pretty good, but you know, I'm just saying if, if that is the scenario, I think the Packers pull the trigger. And by the way, that could be true of Drake London as well. Because again, I have seen him getting mocked in like the top 10. If the Packers have him pegged as the guy, he's got the right size. And, and you know, they, they have gauged his athleticism to be on that next tier. They believe he is that guy. And the only reason I'm, I'm prepping for this is because come draft day, when you get to picks 8, 9, 10, not that I think it's going to happen, but you got to start paying attention because it's entirely possible the Packers look to pull the trigger. And who for all I know, Olave's that guy. I'm not trying to necessarily pitch. I'm just going based on what the boards generally are saying and that Garrett Wilson is that guy. And again, a lot of what I want to start doing is, is thinking a little bit outside of the box because we, we generally stick with 
the same thoughts over and over again. We have pick 22 and we have pick 28 and we might move up a little bit to like, you know, 15-ish and we might get this guy or that guy. Probably a pass rusher and maybe a wide receiver, but it's going to be one of these three wide receivers. Packers are predictable in a couple areas, but when it comes to the actual pick, they've been never, ever have they been predictable. And so I think, especially as Packer fans, it's a good idea, you know, being in March, a lot of time left to start really thinking of some other possibilities. And that one actually does make sense to me. As much as I, you know, it's, I think people can be a little too obsessed with wide receiver, I do think the Packers are in a position now where they're a wide receiver. Away. And listen, if they love five wide receivers, great, then we don't have to worry about it. Who knows? Maybe there is a trade back involved because, hey, there's plenty of them. But again, what if? What if there's one? And they are just over the moon, cannot get enough of, this is the guy. Because not all 32 teams think alike. Because the general, well, if that's the case, then he's going to go early. No, I said, what if the Packers think that? I didn't say, what if every team in the NFL thinks that? By the way, you got other teams with other needs, right? Probably, none of these guys are probably going to go top five. Then you got quarterback needy teams, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. You got premier offensive tackles. You're going to take a wide receiver when there's premier offensive tackles and you need an offensive tackle? I doubt it. So just something to think about. All right, let's get to uh, Patrick's question. I skipped this one last time because he listed several guys and I needed more time to be able to actually go through these. So Patrick says, can you take a look at Sam Williams, Brian Asamoah, Asamoah, however you pronounce that, and, J- and Jalen Weidermeyer? He says, edge rusher, linebacker, and a tight end. They should draft another guy, even if Merciless returns, and tight end the same. So let me just tell you right off the bat, and I've mentioned this before, Jalen Weidermeyer, although he's still consensus like number two tight end, is expected to fall completely out of the draft. His, his athleticism is that bad. And so I have no expectation. I mean, he may get drafted at the, you know, sixth, seventh round or something. Somebody wants to take a flyer on him because he was liked for some kind of a thing. So who knows? Maybe. I don't know. But um, I can tell you that right off the bat. If you're looking for another guy, that ain't the guy. But we'll take a look at Brian Asamoah real quick. On the consensus big board, he's sitting at about 113, linebacker out of Oklahoma. His RAS was at an 882. Um Really, the only reason it wasn't higher is because he's six foot two twenty six. So he's very small for a linebacker, but elite speed and elite explosion. He ran a four five six forty. So um, it's it means a little bit less in this draft class because everybody's running ridiculous times and everything. But uh, still, very athletic guy. PFF, on the other hand, again, remember the consensus board is just consensus, which means some people have him higher, some people have him lower, but it averages out about there. PFF actually likes the guy a lot more. They have him ranked as the fourth best linebacker in the draft class, 39th overall, meaning early second round prospect. Um, He had kind of a breakout year in 2021 as far as his PFF grade is concerned, 76.3 overall grade. And the thing that I love about that is that everything was was good across the board. 71 run defense, 84 tackling, 66 pass rush, 74 coverage, right? There was, it, it wasn't like he's an elite this, but terrible and everything else. He was solid across the board. Um, he had 14 pressures on 51 attempts, which I really feel like that's the, the, I don't know if I mentioned that before, that's kind of the wave of the future with these linebackers, especially after Micah Parsons. It's just these guys that are really fast and can come on blitzes and just wreck stuff. Um, he's one of those guys. I think the top three linebackers you watch their highlights and stuff. That's they're doing a ton of that. But 14 pressures on the season is a lot for uh, for a linebacker. Had 68 tackles, uh, targeted 34 times, 28 receptions, 82 percent, which is kind of high. But I don't know exactly for linebackers. For corners, that would be high. Gave up 259 yards, one touchdown, no picks, and a pass breakup. 108.2 pass rating when targeted. So the statistics don't do much. But again, out of 302 coverage snaps, they gave him a 74 overall grade. Um, some of his pros, serious range, tracking down running backs on wide runs was easy money for him. Violent tackler. I got to watch this guy. I'm sold already. He's, he's fast, tracks guys down. He's a violent tackler. I'm, I'm watching him as soon as I'm done with this podcast. Attacks ball carriers with no fear. Was far more under control in 2021. He is so fluid, changing directions in space. So that's that, that pro right there gets me really excited because he's a toolsy guy, right? He's super fast. He's obviously got some some power to him and all that stuff. That's great. But there's a lot of fast linebackers that just can't put it all together. Um, to hear he was more under control in 2021 is a good thing because harnessing that is the hardest part. Finding athletes at this point just is not hard anymore. Everyone's a freak athlete, but finding guys that can harness it and turn that into being a really good football player, that's tough. Uh, cons built like a safety goes backward on contact when taken on blocks too easily. I hate that with a passion, but you got to, you know, take your picks. You find a six foot two twenty six guy. You're, you're going to see some of that. That was the reason why I could never get on board with, uh, it was a bear, was a Roquan. His college tape was just him getting blown up by everybody. And I just couldn't get behind that. 
has to play around blocks at his size, often leads to him not being square to the line. Overly uh, reactive by eye candy, fakes motions, et cetera, from opposing offenses. That's kind of very similar to the um, what I said about Christian Harris. It sounds very similar. He hits violently. He's very fast. Does a good job tracking stuff down and running people down. But he is a little bit undersized. He does get blown up a little bit. And yeah, he gets he gets he gets a little over aggressive. But I but again, similarly, when you're talking about the Packers, the fact that we already have Devondre Campbell, I don't hate it as much. His role is more or less going to be go chase. Your role is to be aggressive. Right? That running back takes off down the field, you go chase him. And quickly, before the offensive lineman can get up and block you. So I, you know, I think everything about that is, is the profile of an athletic 228-pound linebacker. I do like the fact that he's listed as being, um, or regarded as being violent. That's a nice touch for, for being an undersized linebacker. But I think you know what you're getting when you get a guy like this. And the, the benefit of it, and generally when teams get guys like this, it's to have another compliment. I don't know if you, you want your lone linebacker to be like this guy that can't really take on blocks and has to kind of shed and, and run around blockers and all that kind of stuff. But depending on how often your team runs with two linebackers, which the Packers, it's not their primary mode of function, which is why a second round maybe is a little bit questionable. But, you know, I mean, Chris Barnes had 500 snaps, so that's, that's a decent amount. And Oren Burks had 200. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. I'm skeptical they'll do it, and I'm skeptical that they'd be interested in, in a guy like this, but I, I like it. I like kind of that yin and yang. It's kind of like having two running backs. You got the thunder and lightning thing. Same thing with linebacker. It doesn't have to be that way. You can have thunder, thunder, lightning, lightning, or whatever weird combo in between. But I just, I just like it, providing you that versatility to be able to, to, to kind of take on whatever the offense throws at you. And finally, Sam Williams, edge rusher out of Mississippi. Uh, that's Ole Miss. He's ranked 88th overall on the consensus board. The highest rank that he's been is 79th. So he's kind of hovered in that third, fourth round range. Maybe fifth, I don't know. But uh, six foot four, two sixty five. He kind of fits that that mold of of you know being the size that the Packers seem to like. Again, I don't really know what Joe Barry's preference is. He kind of has been operating with with um, Mike Pettin's guys, but it, generally the NFL seems to like the six four, two sixty five guys. As far as his grades, uh, sixty seven, sixty six, and then seventy eight. So he did have that explosive year, which is great. Um, he is a pure pass rusher as opposed to being a run defender, which I have really no issue with. Um, he's not bad at run defense, but 65, 54, 65, he's, he's okay. And I do like that he's clearly not just an undersized speed rusher. He's not 250 pounds. 265, he's got some meat on his bones. But his pass rush grades, 69, 77, and 92 this past year. So, or not 90, 90.2. But uh, elite grade, 61 pressures on 451 attempts is 13.5%. That's pretty solid. He also had 13 sacks, so even the sack production was up there. So all around a pretty good year. Um, the consistency would be somewhat of an issue, but he still has a, a high floor. So probably more than half of the year he was in the 60s or lower, but his lowest grade was a 54. So he doesn't have those random 20, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s. It was a 54, and he's only got two games under a 60, and one of them was a 59.5. So really only one quote-unquote bad day, and it was a week one against Louisville. And it was 54.4, which is not that bad of a day. He still had four pressures in a sack in that game. So again, it's one of those things where if that's a bad day, I'm fine with that. So it's it's nice to have a guy that has consistency, at least consist, consistently not bad, with a handful of really good games. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six of his games were 70 and above. Three of his games were 80 and above. And he had one game against Austin P, which, you know, granted, not the best program in the world, but week two against Austin P, 93.2 overall grade, seven pressures and two sacks. So if you want to see him just wreck somebody, there you go. If you want to see him play really well against a quality team, check out Mississippi State and Texas A&M. He had his two highest grades. Mississippi State in particular was actually his best production game, 82.3 overall grade, but nine pressures and two sacks. So if you want to check out Sam Williams, see if you can find him against Mississippi State. Uh, if you want to see a little bit more kind of generally what he is, a little bit more in between, check out Tennessee. Maybe, although he had six pressures and two sacks in that game. That's really high. It's hard to find him not have a, a really just bang up day. Maybe Auburn, um, 70.5 overall grade, five pressures and one sack would be a little bit more standard. Um, Vanderbilt, he had a 62 overall grade, four pressures, zero sacks. If you want to see a little bit on the lower end. Um, Alabama, obviously, if you want to see against the best competition, he had a 62 overall grade, four pressures in a sack. So again, the consistency is crazy. He had four pressures in a sack against two. He had the same 
defensive production against Alabama as he did against Tulane. You know, different different grades because the consistency isn't there. He's not winning as consistently against Alabama as he is Tulane, but ultimately the production is there, and, and it's not that big of a difference. 60 compared to 70? When you're talking about the difference between Alabama and Tulane, it's a massive difference. So I do like that aspect of it. Uh, PFF doesn't have them in their scouting guide, but uh, the Draft Network does have their scouting report of him. It says he's ideally suited to play in a 3-4 defense, so that does, you know, the scheme fit works. It says he's more strong than he is explosive, less than ideal flexibility, does demonstrate some power in his hands, particularly when he flashes a bull rush to knock the offensive tackle back, could be more effective against the run, Says he lacks a good motor in situations, which that's one of my favorite uh, attributes in a pass rusher is just never giving up. He ends up getting to the quarterback anyway, so it's it's hard to envision, but there you go. Uh, football IQ, he does play with some awareness, particularly when defending against zone read heavy teams. He has adequate lateral mobility and movement skills overall. He lacks a true positional versatility and should be used as a 3-4 outside linebacker only. So there you go. Well, I think I'm going to leave it at that. I've got to get ready for, um, we're doing our Packernet meetings on Saturday, so I got to get that going. I will get to the rest of your questions. We got a ton of questions from Andy, from Steve, from Wayne, so we'll get to those um, probably tomorrow. Appreciate you guys tuning in, and I will talk to you all tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.